This is CyberSound, your simplified and fundamentals focused source for all things cybersecurity, with your hosts, Jason Pufal, Stephen Maresca, and Matt Fusaro. Welcome to CyberSound. I'm your host, Jason Pufal, joined today by Matt Fusaro and Stephen Maresca. Hey, guys. Hey. No hey from Matt. No, I'm reading. Oh, no hay no. at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes I get too engrossed. In that things. doesn't bode well yeah. for this episode. <laughs> uh, well, may maybe it's because of the exciting topic today, right? On October 11th, um, the White House put out a, a you know a release about a fact sheet where it's a digest, right? Digest, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, where the the current administration delivers on strengthening America's cybersecurity. Uh, I didn't count all the bold things. One, two, three. I mean, there's you know, ten or twelve sort of high level bolded elements in here. I think we'll talk about you know three or four of them uh, in general. But you know the 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 sheet is intended to describe all the things that are occurring relative to cybersecurity. Uh, you know during the administration of both uh, Biden and Harris. So um, I think the first one we wanted to chat about was the bullet that says that they're ensuring new infrastructure is smart and secure. Uh, and I think, so I'm going to call Matt out, I think, on this. One, he didn't say hello, so I feel like he deserves to, to speak That's first, fair. right? That's fair. But, uh, but you, know, you, you had a couple of thoughts here, and I thought yeah. maybe kick it off there. So I don't like how they're pairing the, uh, uh, the title of this particular thing that they're trying to do, you know, ensuring new infrastructure is smart and secure. And then they're mostly talking about providing high-speed internet to places, which yeah, I'm not sure that that really helps infrastructure be secure. Sure, I think it's something that probably should be done, especially in, you know, underserved areas. But um, then they go on to say that they're providing a billion dollars in funding over four years, which is not very much if you think about it from a large scale. Right. right. You're talking about state uh, local and territorial. So you, th this isn't just the you know contiguous states here. We're talking about a lot. A billion dollars isn't going to get you much over four years. Over four years. Talking about infrastructure, no way. Um, and I'm not sure that all new infrastructure needs to be so s smart. Right? Well, it, it, so the, <laughs> it's the word "smart" that bothers yeah. me the most. You know, because right. yeah, nowadays everything has to be smart. I think our emphasis should be on secure. And, and I think actually they have a couple of ideas further down this list that I. That are that are nice to hear about that, but yeah, the smart part, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I mean, infrastructure lately, their major problems aren't so much cyber; they're more being susceptible to elements. Right. So, well, so, so let, let's let's step away from the broadband internet mm -hmm. kind of component of this. The the state and local cybersecurity grant program that's being discussed here really is a pretty open ended funding pool, is my right. understanding. Yeah entities can apply. They have like 60 days to do so. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of money available for, for this fiscal year, but it's to fund, you know, existing or to be defined cybersecurity programs. It seems pretty, you know, generic about that. Assessments as well as corrections of, of things that are longstanding, like critical infrastructure oriented, uh, SCADA devices, yeah, I... uh, you know, connected valves, things of that sort that they have... Uh, need to replace. I think that's part of the underpinning here. Not so much, you know, uh, being too pigeonholed. Right. The yeah. I mean, personally, I'd like to see if they were more prescriptive about the things that people had to use the money for. Because I think you know, just generally saying you know, cybersecurity improvements is so generalized, and I don't know that that people always make the best decisions about what those improvements should be. I'd love for them to be more specific about you know implementing MFA or implementing, you know, things that we know to make sort of a substantive difference, especially for, you know, organizations that may not have a robust pro program, but, um, all right, moving on down the list. Uh, I think we wanted to chat a little bit here about which one here, developing the new label to help Americans oh, yeah. know their devices are secure. I'm actually really pleased to see this one. I know you are. Um, so for, for some context here, uh, easily six years ago, uh, one of the programs to come out of, uh, you know, a well-known individual in 
the cybersecurity research space involved something kind of like underwriters laboratories for uh, connected devices, for electronic devices, with the intent being that there's some sort of label developed to indicate the relative uh, rigor put behind those devices development and whether they're secure. It never really panned out. It was a research effort, lots of good data collected basically to, again, justify its um, the fact that it's a reasonable thing to do. But it it petered out. If this is a reawakening of that same sort of effort, I, I am completely supportive of it. Specifically, they're talking about devices like uh, internet connected cameras and uh, other IoT devices. Home routers. Yeah. Right. Home routers. The, the types of devices that are you know likely to fall over and do so with regularity. So if we're starting there, I think that's a great place. Well, and, and I'm particularly interested in things. The, the routers are nice. I think that'd be a, a great spot, but I agree with you. It's those devices where you have no visibility in, or ability to upgrade or manage or monitor them anyway. Your, your, your smart cameras. Like I have one now that literally plugs into like a light socket and you can run it out of a normal lamp post. And it's a complete black box made by kind of some you know, third rate manufacturer. I have no confidence at all in this. It would be great to have a, a label on that, I think. And, and I think people would get a lot of value out of that. Right. It, it'll be interesting to see how they actually develop this. The, the testing standards and the body that actually has to certify these things and apply the label. It, that's not a small amount of work. Right. And <laughs> so the development of the standards that you have to adhere to, right? Yeah. It, and you know, th this isn't this isn't something that's going to be a one time and done. It'll probably have to be reevaluated every time there's a small change to that product, a firmware upgrade. Um, right. The the biggest challenge with the earlier effort that I mentioned, which is uh, it's called the Cyber ITL CyberITL.org, if anyone wants to go check that out, um, basically was that there's a lot of proprietary code. You can't assess right how secure it is if the vendor is not willing to give you a window into it. Similarly, you know, there's a lot of open source code, you know, things are built cheaply, things are built to a price point. Therefore, uh, vulnerabilities tend to propagate simply to keep the cost low. And, uh, you know, that that's a, that's a hurdle. Manufacturers yeah. may not want recognition well, that there's a deficiency because they're trying to keep the cost where they are. So I wonder if it's going to end up a lot like kind of the health department, right? You know, you get A, B, C, D, F for, you know, you're not necessarily sharing the, uh, the secret uh, secret sauce recipe, right? But they're going to come and say, make sure you know you're not making perpetual stew in the back. I, I'd, right. I'd, <laughs> right. I'd support that. I mean, it is yeah. a cyclical yeah. sort of thing, right. just like a health certificate. I mean, it makes sense. Products change over time. Well, and you know, as much as we took umbrage with the the language like of smart in the in the preceding bullet, the reality is that that is the push for every manufacturer, right? It's the smart cameras, the smart refrigerators, et cetera, having some designation, right? Some set of standards and some designations to give people confidence. It's just one more element in the buying process, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of value that comes out of it. Using your, uh, what was it? A light bulb connected yeah, light bulb yeah. example. If, if, all that comes out of this truly is a labeling standard that says this device connects to the internet. It only connects to this location and any other traffic is unexpected or, you know, something like that. I'd be pretty satisfied, candidly. It'd be a great start. Right. Because at the moment, you have no real awareness of what they do in any capacity and you just have to take as normal whatever they do. That's not reasonable right. in my opinion. So, so you know, trust, but... You can't verify. Right. 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 Yeah. I mean, I, I think that this would be a successful endeavor if at the end of it, um, it keeps the riffraff out. You know, not just anybody can come out with a device and slap a label on it. Right. So there has to be some, there's a vetting process and um, some recourse when you don't adhere to the standards. If you put a label on something and then you program it to do exactly the opposite of what's on the label, there needs to be some recourse. There. Right. Right. Here's what I expect. I mean, if we're talking about similar schemes where you have to have your FCC ID uh, for some sort of radio frequency device, right. where you need to have your UL certificate or equivalent for something that is life safety or, you know, electronic connected to the grid, you can buy stuff that doesn't have that. Yep. It's just that it has implications like for homeowners insurance. I'd expect that the backdoor path toward this becoming standardized is in fact that type of yeah, um, origin. 
ultimately, net improvement is what I'm after. I, if, if it's a small incremental step, that's great. Yep. So a little further down, building the nation's cyber workforce and strengthening cyber education, uh, which is great to hear in the sense that we've, we've chatted on previous podcasts about the uh, challenge of finding good, sort of, sort of trained or capable uh, folks to work in the security industry. Um, right? and, and there's a very, there's a variety of stressors that maybe doesn't make this the most appealing position for a lot of people, but it's nice to see some, some thought there. Yeah, there's a, there are par parallels here and sort of a uh, the underpinning for this particular item in cybersecurity is actually the apprenticeship program for manufacturing. Long, long in, in place for many industries. That's kind of what they're doing here. They're just introducing uh, cyber and cyber adjacent disciplines to the set of apprenticeships that the government incentivizes. Apprenticeship.gov or something to that effect is where you know a lot of this information is housed. Um, you know, there's a lot of good information there. For example, states that have tax credits for uh, facilitating apprenticeships, that type of thing. It's just a way of encouraging growth in a field that frankly doesn't have enough staff to support it. Yeah, I, I think that this is a good thing coming out of uh, coming out of the federal government for this. A recognition that there's a there's a problem and it pro it does present an issue national like for national security and stability. So I think it is nice to have this addressed. Well, there's, um, I wish I wish they would do a little bit more um, advertisement around it, though. Like, I right, agree. Right. We, we didn't know about it until recently, and we're pretty plugged into this stuff. The, you know, this is something that would probably benefit us, right? I, I I'm keen on the apprenticeship aspect of it because if it removes the HR, thou shall not pass barrier of <laughs> yeah. a uh, you know, bachelor's degree and X degrees of experience, which tends to be inhibiting uh, applicants, that's a net win because it's not a it's not the binary that tends to be represented. A lot of job descriptions say or equivalent experience. Sure. That's great. But this helps to quantify experience. Right. It helps to get the experience. The uh, kind of continuing down then, and I think it, it's toward the, the tail end of this document, uh, there's really two, I guess, two bullets that are talking about you know, security relative to quantum computing, right? So uh, developing quantum resistant encryption um, and then you know their technical edge through quantum initiative, which you, is kind of interesting, right? Because I think for a lot of people, quantum computing probably isn't top of mind. Uh, you know, maybe maybe for a lot of companies, not top of risk, right? It, it's certainly in the news a lot lately. For example, uh, Europe, the European Space Agency plans to launch what they call a quantum encryption satellite sometime in 2024 or something of that nature. I'm going to use that <laughs> as sort of a way of pointing out how much people need to pay attention to this. It's the ESA. It's the European Space Agency. Uh, we're talking about quantum stuff, which today remains very much in the realm of nation states and, you know, keeping spies safe. The average bear does have access to some quantum technology, uh, randomness, randomness generators. If you're in the um, uh, electronic gambling industry or anything adjacent to it where you really want strong encryption, you can do that. Um, for the most part, though, quantum oriented stuff, when you hear it in the news, it's it's not the domain of businesses yet. Yeah. It, and as far as making sure that we're future resistant to encryption. Basically what it's saying is that quantum computing can has the ability or it theoretically has the ability to break encryption as we use it today. And we don't want things that have been encrypted to be broken by those systems, you know, a year from now, three years from now. They they might be sealing very sensitive data. Um, and unless it's re-encrypted with new algorithms, it's susceptible to these computers being able to break that. Right. That horizon, though, still doesn't feel too near. Yeah, it's true. I, and at least there's probably systems out there that can do it right now. It's just you don't have access to them. Yeah, it, it's not not readily available to anybody. Um, any of the other items in here that either of you felt you wanted to go through? I, I know those, those are the initial high bar topics that we wanted to cover. Yeah, I mean, in, in general, it's nice to see a continued effort to 
uh, push these things through, uh, provide funding for it, provide some frameworks for things. So that's that's nice to see. You know, re- regardless of how you feel you know, politically about the administration, I think they're over the past, I'd say, ten years now. They, the federal government's done a pretty decent job of putting cybersecurity near the forefront of what they're thinking about. Right. Yeah, and anything fair. to keep it top of mind. Um, I'm happy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and it's evidence. You know, one of the bullets in here was really working with partners to deliver you know, sort of more secure cyberspace. Right. Maybe I don't love that yeah. last word, maybe, but really, right, it's something that's been going on for a long time, which is, you know, the big players in the security industry kind of working more closely with the government or vice versa. Uh, you know, they could, they're, they're obviously positioned to continue to do that. The government has a unique window, a unique perspective that businesses, because of their deliberate competition, it, it's a different dynamic. Anytime a government is pushing forward cybersecurity initiatives, I think it brings everybody up to a a better level, ultimately. Yep. And that's what this is all about. So I think that's fair. Um, So as always, right, certainly we say, you know, go take a look at the the sheet that was released on October 11th. Uh, It's worth a quick read. It's worth understanding, you know, what's in there. Uh, Certainly, I think, generally positive, uh, generally, you know, directionally aligned, uh, certainly with what we think it should be. we hope you got some value out of today. Hopefully you uh, go back and take a look at this and uh, we appreciate everybody's listening. We'd love to hear your feedback. Feel free to get in touch at Vancord on LinkedIn or on Twitter at Vancord Security. And remember, stay vigilant, stay resilient. This has been CyberSound. <laughs>